three, two, one. Happy Father's Day! Woo! Okay, cool. Thanks. Well done, you three. Um, I think for me, what I've been praying for lately, um, especially because we're having a, a baby boy, I've realized that I've got to be the example. <clears throat> He's going to watch me to see how I interact with his mom uh, and figure out how he deals with the opposite sex. Um, he's going to look at me to see how I respond to difficulties in life um, and model that in kind. So I think prayer for me is just that I, I'm a godly, uh, present and loving father. Um, I think that's all I can ask for. With so many uh, morally wrong things happening in the world, it is my prayer that I be able to model the family and bring up the boys in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So help me, uh, God, to be in good standing with you and be a good role model for the boys. Children are a gift of God, and it's a gift that we as parents treasure so much. As a father of teenage children, my prayer is that the Lord will strengthen them in their chore, which is schoolwork, a, a, a difficult task in itself, but not only the complexity of school in itself, but also the complexity of their peer pressure, their gender identity, and the mere interruption of social media in their lives. I just pray that the Lord will allow them to stand firm, the Lord will give them the strength to manage this highway of misunderstanding and that they may all stand firm in His name. Amen. Hi everyone, looking back on my journey of fatherhood, I have made many mistakes and so am constantly dependent on my Heavenly Father for His grace. At the moment I am praying to be able to keep growing in maturity in my faith particularly in the area of patience. The, the more God changes me in this way, the greater blessing I'll be to my family. Thank you. As a father, what do I pray about? What do I ask you to pray for me about? Petrol money, maybe? <laughs> um, but really that I would be a father of Deuteronomy 6. A father who sits his children down and tells them what the Lord has done for me, what the Lord can do for them, and not only to my children, but as a grandfather to my children's children, that I would expose them to Christ in everything I say and everything I do. That's what I pray. Pray for me that I can do that. Now's the time. Now's the time. There's the time. Now's the time to catch up on some of the family news. Carla, tell us a little bit about Holiday Club. So Holiday Club is taking place um, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, not this week, next week. So the 28th, the 29th, and the 30th. Um, if you have Christmas trees, please continue to donate those just for the Holiday um, Club period. And if you um, would like to be a leader, also chat to Jenny about that um, and sign your kids up. Um, it's for kids that are grade R to grade 7. Fantastic. And uh, next week, we're taking a little break from our series in Leviticus. We're going to pick it up the following week. But next week uh, is what we call GWC Sunday, George Whitfield College, a theological training college uh, of our denomination. Uh, we have a special Sunday put aside each year where we get one of the faculty members to come and preach. Uh, which is always a pleasure for us because traditionally, and this year is no exception, uh, we've got faculty who attend St. James as their home church. Uh, we're going to hear from Mike Rowe next year. Uh, next year? That's a long time to wait. Let's try again. Next week. Uh, you may not have met Mike. Uh, Mike and his family joined us just as COVID hit, and so they didn't really get a chance to, to meet everyone uh, straight away. But Mike's on faculty at GWC. He'll be preaching for us next week. We'll be hearing more about the college and what they're up to. So we'll look forward to that as well. And also, just a quick reminder that uh, if you're at home and watching, the SnapScan code will be up for your giving. And for those of us in the room, there are bags at the door again if you would like to give that way. Uh, thank you for your generosity uh, and uh, please an encouragement in these winter months 
Don't spend all your money on wood for your fire. Make sure you still put some aside for the Lord's work. I'm going to ask Ben to come up and uh, do the Bible reading for us. Morning, everyone. The Bible reading today will be taken from Leviticus chapter 16, and we'll be reading the entire chapter. It's Leviticus chapter 16, starting at verse 1. The Lord spoke to Moses after the death of his two sons of Aram, who died when they approached the Lord. The Lord said to Moses, Tell your brother Aaron that he is not to come whenever he chooses into the most holy place behind the curtain in front of the atonement cover on the ark, or else he will die. For I will appear in the cloud over the atonement cover. This is how Aaron is to enter the most holy place. He must first bring a young bull for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He is to put on the sacred linen tunic with linen undergarments next to his body. He is to tie the linen sash around him and put the linen and put on the linen turban. These are sacred garments, so he must bathe himself with water before he puts them on. From the Israelite community, he is to take two male goats for his sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. Aaron is to offer the bull for his own sin offering to make atonement for himself and his household. Then he is to take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the entrance to the tent of meeting. He is to cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other for the scapegoat. Aaron shall bring the goat whose lot falls to the Lord and sacrifice it for a sin offering. But the goat chosen by a lot as the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to be used for making atonement by sending it into the wilderness as a scapegoat. Aaron shall bring the bull for his own sin offering to make atonement for himself and for his household, and he is to slaughter the bull for his own sin offering. He is to take a censer full of burning coals from the altar before the Lord and two handfuls of finely ground fragrant incense and take them behind the curtain. He is to put the incense on the fire before the Lord and the smoke of the incense will conceal the atonement cover above the tables of the covenant law, so that he will not die. He is to take some of the bull's blood, and with his finger, sprinkle it on the front of the atonement cover. Then he shall sprinkle some of it with his finger seven times before the atonement cover. He shall then slaughter the goat for the sin offering for the people, and take its blood behind the curtain, and do with it as he did with the bull's blood. He shall sprinkle it on the atonement cover in front of it. In this way, he will make atonement for the most holy place because of the uncleanliness and rebellion of the Israelites, whatever their sins have been. He is to do the same for the tent of meeting, which is among them in the midst of of their uncleanliness. No one is to be in the tent of meeting from the time Aaron goes in to make the atonement in the most holy place until he comes out having made the atonement for himself, his household, and the whole community of Israel. Then he shall come out from the altar that is before the Lord and make an atonement for it. He shall take some of the bull's blood and some of the goat's blood and put it on all the horns of the altar. He shall sprinkle some of the blood on it with his finger seven times to cleanse it and consecrate it from the uncleanliness of the Israelites." When Aaron has finished making the atonement for the most holy place, the tent of meeting and the altar, he shall bring forward the live goat. He is to lay both hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the wickedness and rebellion of the Israelites, all their sins, and put them on the goat's head. He shall send the goat away into the wilderness in the care of someone appointed for the task. The goat will carry on itself all their sins to a remote place, and the man shall release it into the wilderness. Then Aaron is to go into the tent of meeting and take off the linen garments he put on before he entered the most holy place, and he is to leave them there. He shall bathe himself with water in the sanctuary area and put on his ordinary garments. He shall then come out and sacrifice the burnt offering for himself and the burnt offering for the people to make atonement for himself and for the people. 
he shall also burn the fat of the sin offering on the altar. The man who releases the goat as a scapegoat must wash his clothes and bathe himself with water. Afterwards, he may come into the camp. The bull and the goat for the sin offering, whose blood was brought into the most holy place to make the atonement, must be taken outside the camp. Their hides, flesh, and intestines are to be burnt. The man who burns them must wash his clothes and bathe himself with water. Afterwards, he may come into the camp. This is to be a lasting ordinance for you. On the tenth day of the seventh month, you must deny yourselves and not do any work, whether native-born or a foreigner residing among you, because on this day atonement will be made to you, to cleanse you. Then, before the Lord, you will be clean from all your sin. It is a day of Sabbath rest, and you must deny yourselves. It is a lasting ordinance. The priest who is anointed and ordained to succeed his father as high priest must make an atonement. He is to put on the sacred linen garments and make an atonement for the most holy place, for the tent of meeting and the altar, and for the priests and all the members of the community. This is to be a lasting ordinance for you. Atonement is to be made once a year for all the sin of the Israelites. And it was done as the Lord commanded Moses. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see you all. Uh, thank you to the Stormers who must have heard me last week. Um, we are all enjoying Biltong today. Um, a happy Father's Day also from me to all the dads, uh, granddads, and father figures who are here with us this morning. I uh, hope you've had a good start to your day. And my prayer for us also is that uh, we would change what fatherhood looks like in our culture and in our society as Christian dads and as Christian men. Uh, so that when people look at us, they may see what true fatherhood looks like uh, as we model uh, our fatherhood on that of God Himself our great Heavenly Father. For those who are here and who haven't come to recognize God as Father, well, I've prayed for you today uh, and for this week as well, uh, asking that today might be that day. Uh, accepting God as your Father is the greatest gift that you can get, even on Father's Day, uh, better than any nuts, biltong, or dried fruit, or any SUVs. Um, if you're new or visiting, then a, a big hello to you. For those who are watching a little bit later in our service, hi. Uh, from the comfort of your home. Uh, my name is Gareth, part of the team here at St. James. Uh, we're grateful to have you here with us. We're at, a, at the halfway stage in our series in Leviticus. I've enjoyed it so far. I'm, I hope you have too. I'm thankful for the feedback I've received and the encouragement. There's been a lot to digest, and so hopefully next week when we take a little break, uh, that'll be a good time for you to have a breather before we continue in uh, Leviticus uh, thereafter. We may be at the halfway stage in the book of Leviticus, but today we've actually reached the heart of Leviticus. Remember the overarching question of Leviticus is this. How can a holy God and a sinful people draw near to one another, dwell in one another's presence, or commune with one another? How would you answer that question if someone even asked you today? How can you or I or anyone approach a holy God when we are a sinful people? How can we draw near to God? How can you dwell and have God dwell in the same space? How can you commune with God? This week I had the rare privilege of spending some time with um, Uncle Frank just briefly before a funeral, Bishop Frank Retief, as many of you know him as. And for those who don't, he started our church uh, 54 years ago. He asked what I was preaching on. I said, Leviticus 16, Uncle Frank, oh dear. Um, and he said, well, what is it that you're going to tell the people? So I said to him, I'm going to be a very unpopular preacher on Sunday because I'm going to talk about sin. And uh, I have a genuine concern that we don't hear about sin enough. And uh, the gospel-hearted man that Uncle Frank is said, go for it, young man, and just make sure you tell them the gospel. Friends, in our day, it seems to me that we talk about sin as much as we talk about Bruno. And if any one of you have seen the animated movie Encanto, you'll know that we don't talk about Bruno. Now, obviously, many of you wouldn't have understood what I meant there. But that's okay. For afternoon uh, pleasure, go and watch the movie. Go and watch the movie. Um, we don't talk about sin enough. 
We don't confront people with it. We don't think about it. We hate talking about sin. But that's not the case with the Bible. The Bible makes it abundantly clear that everyone who has ever lived, everyone who is currently living, everyone who will ever live, has a heart that is tainted and stained by sin. Yes, you might consider yourself a good person, a moral person, a kind person, a just person, a generous person. You might even be a church-going or religious person, good for you, but you are also a sinful person. Someone who is a sinner says to God, I'm all good, I can do this on my own. Thanks for coming, but I don't need you. That is the nature of sin. Sin flows from a heart that rebels against God. It's not so much about what you do and don't do, but it's where your heart's at. And sin needs to be dealt with. In the language of today's passage, sin needs to be atoned for. But the question remains, how? That was the very same question that the Israelites had to answer. Now, fortunately, God gave them the answer. For them, they needed a sacrificial system to be in place, and we saw that in chapters 1 to 7. They also needed a mediating priesthood, and we looked at that last week in chapters 8 to 10. The reason these needed to be in place was ultimately so that atonement could be made and that God and man can be at one with one another once again. That is what the Day of Atonement is all about, how God and sinful man can be at one. It is how God ultimately deals with the problem of sin. So as we get into this chapter, let me briefly open for us in a word in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you now, Lord, and we just have one simple request. Help us to understand the need of and the importance for atonement. Father, help us to have a real grasp of the gravity of sin, but even more significantly, Lord, help us to grasp the gravity of your grace. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We have come to Yom Kippur, the day that is so significant in Jewish tradition that it is simply known as the day. The Sabbath of Sabbaths is how some refer to it. It is the holiest and most somber day of the year in the Jewish calendar, and this year it will be celebrated on the 4th of October. The reason they still celebrate it to this day is because Leviticus 16 tells them to. Three times it tells them when, why, and how they are to celebrate the Day of Atonement. Let's look at the end of our passage, Leviticus 16, 29 to 34. This is to be a lasting ordinance for you. On the tenth day of the seventh month, you must deny yourselves and not do any work, whether native-born or foreigner residing among you, because on this day, atonement will be made for you, to cleanse you. Then, before the Lord, you will be clean from all your sins. It is a Sabbath day of rest, and you must deny yourselves. It is a lasting ordinance. Verse 34, this is to be a lasting ordinance for you. Atonement is to be made once a year for all the sins of the Israelites. This once a year event was meant to be a lasting ordinance. Twice we read that Israel are to deny or afflict themselves, which is why it is considered a somber day. It is a day committed to personal reflection, repentance, confession, prayer, fasting, a day where they deny themselves the luxuries and pleasures of life, a Sabbath-like day where they do no work. Israel are to remember forever that this is a day with a difference, and it's the day that makes all the difference. Now, before we look at what differentiates this day, let's briefly consider the occasion that initiated the revelation of this day. Have a look at Leviticus 16, verse 1. The Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron who died when they approached the Lord. The reference here is back to Leviticus 10, which we looked at last week. Nadab and Abihu, Aaron's sons, decided to approach or draw near to God in a way that was contrary to what was commanded. The result? 
It was their untimely and sudden death. They were incinerated by the fires of God's wrath and judgment. Now, it's ironic because those who were best qualified to make sacrifices and offerings on behalf of the people have now, like a sacrifice, been consumed by the fire. And in ancient Israel, corpse pollution, the defilement caused by a dead body, was considered the father of all defilement. A place and a people would be dirty if there was a corpse close by. Now, as a result of the sins of Nadab and Abihu, the tabernacle, God's sanctuary, has been defiled and polluted, and it needs to be cleansed. This is the occasion that has sparked the revelation from God to Moses for the Day of Atonement. Aaron is told how he should now enter, not like his sons, but in the way God prescribes. There are four things I want us to look at that make this day the day with a difference. The first is this, where the priest goes. Notice in verse 2 that we are about to unlock a new location known as the most holy place. Up until now, sacrifices and offerings were made where? Well, at the entrance to the tent of meeting or in the holy place. But on this day, things will be different because of the seriousness of sin and the need for atonement. It's worth taking our time briefly to see what the tabernacle in fact looked like. There she is in all her glory. I saw that for only $63, you can order your very own 328-piece tabernacle model kit. Uh, how's that for a fun Father's Day gift? Now, the geography of Israel worked as follows. Five concentric circles. The outermost circle represented the wilderness, the far extremes. Then coming in one level, we have Israel and their camp, set up in a very specific way around the tabernacle which you see there. When you look at the tabernacle itself, you can see that it's divided into three parts. There is the outer courtyard, and then coming in a little bit closer, you've got the holy place. And then finally, behind the curtain, you have the most holy place. Access into this most holy place was reserved for the high priest and for the Day of Atonement. Inside this most holy place was the Ark of the Covenant, and it is there that the great high priest was meant to meet with God. Now, the Ark of the Covenant was a box, a rectangular treasure chest, basically. And on top of it was this giant golden lid known as the atonement cover or the mercy seat. We have a picture of what the Ark may have looked like, something like that. Now, as you look at that, listen to these words from God to Moses regarding the atonement cover from Exodus 25. Make an atonement cover of pure gold and make two cherubim out of hammered gold at the ends of the cover. Those are the angels. Make one cherub on one end, the second cherub on the other. Make the cherubim of one piece with the cover at the two ends. The cherubim are to have their wings spread upward, overshadowing the cover with them. The cherubim are to face each other, looking toward the cover. Place the cover on top of the ark. And put in the ark the tablets of the covenant law that I will give you. All of this. Why? Exodus 25, 22. There, above the cover, between the two cherubim that are over the ark of the covenant law, I will meet with you and give you all my commands for the Israelites. God is going to appear to Aaron on top of that atonement cover, in between those two cherubim, and that's where he'll meet God on the day where he comes to make atonement for his own sins, the sins of his household, and for the people of Israel. Now, the second thing that distinguishes this day is what the priest wears. Up until now, the priest has worn some impressive, elaborate, ornate clothing. He's looked like a royal figure among the Israelites as he's represented God to them, but not on the day of atonement. Verse 4, he must put on a sacred linen outfit. A linen tunic, linen underwear, linen sash, a linen turban. It sounds incredibly comfortable. The significance of this is as follows. The Day of Atonement is about stripping away all status and honor. When it comes to sin, God takes it so seriously that even His elected priests must submit themselves and come to Him with humility. The priest takes on the nature of a servant or a slave 
as he approaches the holy God of Israel in clothing that depicts this status. Thirdly, notice what the priest does before he gets dressed. The priest has a ritual bath. According to Jewish traditions, at some stage, the priests were bathing up to five times a day and washing their hands ten times a day. Now, that's more than most of us during the heart of lockdown when we were paranoid about COVID. The significance, though, must once again not be overlooked. The washing of water symbolizes cleansing or purification from the defilement and the pollution that is caused by sin. He baths at the start of the day, and then in verse 23 and 24, we see that he baths at the end of the day before he puts on his regular priestly uniform and goes and makes burnt offerings. Notice how anyone who's involved in this day must bath. The man who takes the goat out into the wilderness must come back and have a bath. The one who takes the burnt and sin offerings outside, he too must have a bath in verse 28. God wants the seriousness of sin and the need for atonement to soak in for the Israelites. Where the priest goes, what the priest wears, what the priest does, and what the priest brings that makes it so different. Firstly, because he's going to the most holy place, you'll notice in verse 12 and 13 that he takes a censer with him, which is a bowl. And he takes it full of burning coals from the altar, as well as two handfuls of incense. Why? Well, who is it that he's meeting with? God himself. And can anyone look God directly in the face without being blown away by his holiness? Absolutely not. Moses, in Exodus 33, says this to God, Now show me your glory. God's bestie Moses wants to see him face to face. How does God respond? I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I'll have mercy on whom I'll have mercy, compassion on whom I have compassion. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. So the incense is going to create a massive smoke screen between the high priest and God so that they cannot meet face to face. It will conceal the atonement cover so that the priest will not die, verse 13. This is a preventative measure to protect the high priest who enters the most holy place bearing the sins and guilt of himself and the people of Israel before a holy God. So because of where he's going, he has to take this bowl with him. And because of what he's going to do, he brings with him two goats. Two goats for the sin offering. Now we've looked at what makes the day different, but now we consider the difference that this day makes. The crux of this passage is what happens to these two goats. For sin to be fully atoned for, God requires sin to be expunged and expelled. In verse 7, we see that both goats are presented to the Lord as if one. In verse 8, we have this unique ritual where lots are cast for the two goats. Their names are put in a bowl, maybe. It's spun around, and Aaron pulls them out. One, we read, is the lot is for the goat for the Lord, um, and the second lot is for the scapegoat, if you have the NIV. Or if you have the, e, um, the ESV, it will say the goat for Azazel. Verse 9 and 10 explain the outcome for each of the goats. The goat for the Lord is the one that is sacrificed as an offering, and the scapegoat is sent into the wilderness. Both goats are needed for atonement to be made, and collectively they demonstrate to us and Israel what the purpose of atonement is. The first goat is slaughtered as a sacrifice to make atonement. It's a sin offering similar to that of chapter 4. In verse 15 to 19, we read about the death of of this first goat. This goat is the substitutionary sacrifice that pays the penalty for sin. It dies on behalf of the people and it brings about purification. Having slaughtered the lamb, he then takes the blood of the goat and he sprinkles it on the atonement cover and in front of it seven times, we are told. Notice in verse 16 the purpose of the sprinkled blood. In this way, he will make atonement for the most holy place because of the uncleanness and rebellion of the Israelites, whatever their sins have been. He is to do the same for the tent of meeting, 
which is among them in the midst of their uncleanness. Now, back in chapter 1, we saw that there were occasions where you could make sacrifices for sin. But the Day of Atonement is different in that it is the one, it's the cover all day. It's the day where anything, any business that's been left undone, any sins that haven't been covered for, it's on this day that they will be atoned for. And we see that the sprinkling of the blood is the thing that uh, separates it and makes it so significant. But notice here that atonement is actually made for the most holy place and for the tent of meeting. God's tabernacle itself is being purified because that's what atonement has to do with. Both the wiping away, the purging or the expunging of sin and the pollution that it causes. Throughout the year, God's tabernacle is being defiled by a sinful priest who represents a sinful people. And so in one sense, the tabernacle builds up this, um, this defilement, and it needs its annual sin sprinkling, so to speak, the Day of Atonement. The sprinkled blood is the purification agent, and it speaks to the cleansing that happens when atonement is made. The blood is the most significant element in the sacrificial rituals. This is hopefully the nugget of insight you may have picked up if you read Leviticus 17 in preparation for today. The key verse in Leviticus 17, 11 is this. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. There is power, power, wonder-working power, krach, krach, wonderwerkend krach, where? In the blood of the Lamb. The life, we are told, is in the blood. But you can only have the life if there has been death. And so when the blood is sprinkled on the atonement cover, it shows that a sacrificial, substitutionary, penalty-paying death has taken place. And therefore, God and man can be at one again. The sacrificial ritual of the first goat fixes the defilement problem that was caused by the deaths of Nadab and Abihu, Aaron's sons. And so now that atonement has taken place, God's tabernacle has once again been purified for the year ahead. For atonement to take place, sin must be expunged. That is the purpose of the first goat. The first goat makes all the difference because through its death, purification takes place and sin is atoned for. But what about the second goat? The goat for Azazel is the other side of the same coin. It too makes atonement for sin, but from a different angle or perspective. We read about the second goat in verses 20 to 22. Let's just quickly address the question that's on everyone's minds. Who on earth is Azazel? You'll see that if you look at the ESV translation there, the, second, uh, the final sentence, Aaron shall cast lots for the other two goats, one lot for the Lord, the other lot for Azazel. In the NIV, we have the scapegoat. The reason that's included is probably because the translators didn't know how best to translate the phrase, and so they left you wondering what the heck is going on there. The re there, are, um, there are four different meanings for Azazel, which is why it's so difficult to decide what it means. The first one is the most straightforward. It's the goat that is sent away. The second one means that Azazel can mean to completely destroy. And so you can understand why some might consider that to be the translation. Because as the goat is sent into the wilderness to the far ends of the earth, it is going to be completely destroyed out there. Thirdly, it could mean a rocky, uh, a rocky place, a precipice, the place of cutting off, it says. And so again, you can make a case for why that might be the translation, as the goat gets sent away into the wilderness. I think of those three, the goat that is sent away is the most straightforward and makes the most sense in this context. For interest's sake, though, this is the kind of stuff that propels my engine. Um, in Jewish traditions, there is a, a, a wilderness demon known as Azazel. And so some say that maybe a ransom is being paid to this demon. Now, what on earth the people who came up with this uh, were thinking? I'm not entirely sure. Because this is surely the most, uh, the most least, I mean, the least likely meaning for the word. God owes nothing to no one. And so no ransom is to be paid to some wilderness goat demon. What the second goat means is that sin needs to be expelled. The goat is sent away into the wilderness. It is a scapegoat, as the NIV says, because it takes the blame on behalf of another. It demonstrates to Israel 
the removal of sins from the presence of God. Psalm 103, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is His steadfast love to those who fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has He removed our transgressions or sins from us. This goat, Aaron must lay his hands on in verse 21. He confesses over it all the wickedness and rebellion of the people of Israel. All their sins are symbolically put onto this goat. And the goat then carries the sins of the people away into the wilderness. Sin must be expelled from the presence of God. So these two rituals then lie at the heart of the Day of Atonement. One goat dies on behalf of the people, and its blood is used for the cleansing and purification of the place where God dwells. God's place can't bear the defilement of sin. The other goat is for removing sin as far away from the presence of God as possible. God and sin are incompatible, and so God judges sin and expels it from His presence. Atonement, on the Day of Atonement, reaches right to the heart of God, His inner sanctuary, the most holy place, and it propels sin to the furthest part of the earth. For sins to be fully atoned for, it must be expunged and expelled. And the purpose of atonement is this, for a holy God and a sinful people to be at one. The Day of Atonement was the climax for tabernacle worship and the sacrificial system, but it was pointing ahead to an even greater day that would supersede it for the rest of history. That day was the first Good Friday, when the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world was slain at the cross of Calvary. Dressed like a slave or a servant, clothes divided up by lot, about to endure the bowl or cup of God's wrath, like a lamb led to the slaughter, the one on whom the iniquity of us all was laid, a man of sorrows, Jesus Christ. Paul says to the church in Rome, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of His blood to be received by faith. In Hebrews chapter 9, we read about the significance of the blood of Christ. Hebrews 9.22, the law requires nearly everything to be cleansed by blood and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Jesus entered into that most holy place once for all by His own blood. He appeared once for all to take away the sins of the world by the sacrifice of Himself. The sacrificial death of Jesus Christ makes full atonement for sins. He offered His own blood for us in order to have eternal salvation. He took all our sins upon Himself and He carried them away to judgment. Jesus served the purpose on the cross of both goats. And since then, there has been no need for the Day of Atonement. Jesus paid the penalty for our sins, died as our substitute, purified us once for all, takes away our sins, averts the wrath that God has aimed at sin. And He did all of this so that you and I can have access to God. How can a holy God and a sinful people be reconciled? through the atonement. This is the heart of the gospel. We must preach atonement. American preacher Charles Spurgeon said this, the blood of Christ is the life of the gospel. Apart from the atonement, you may know the skin, the rind, the husk, but its inner kernel you have not discovered. Without the atonement, no man is a Christian. And Christ is not Jesus. If you have torn away the sacrificial blood, you have drawn the heart heart out of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and you have robbed it of its life. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this is the gospel. Because of our sin, God loved us enough to send His own Son to die on our behalf so that we by faith can have access to Him and be at one with Him. If this is you then today you do nothing but give thanks for what He's done. Thank God for the gravity of His grace. Draw near to God with full assurance and an unshakable confidence and glory and bask in this glorious gospel. Tell every sinner whom you meet of their need for forgiveness 
and of the God who loves them, preach the atoning sacrifice of the Lamb of God and sing of the worthiness of the Lamb. But for those who do not yet know Jesus and have not accepted His atoning sacrifice, I encourage you with these words. Trembling sinner, look to Jesus and thou art saved. Does thou say my sins are many? His atonement is wondrous. Does thou cry my heart is hard? Jesus can soften it. Does thou exclaim I am so unworthy? Jesus loves the unworthy. Does thou feel I am so vile? It is the vile Jesus came to save. Down with thee, sinner, down, down with thyself, and up with Christ, who has suffered for thy sins upon Calvary's cross. Friend, God the Father loves you, Jesus loves you, and he died for you. So my prayer for you is that you will come to him, because Jesus makes all the difference. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that Jesus does indeed make all the difference. Father, there are people here, some who are close to you and some who are far away. Lord, you know them, and we pray that you would draw those who are far near to you. Father, thank you that Jesus is the one who achieved uh, atonement for us. Through his death, he expunged sin, and he expelled it from your presence. Father, only in Christ can we find true life, and so we thank you that he is the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. Help us to continue to love and trust you and to share that message with those who have not yet heard it. Please would you go before us now, and Lord, as we sing these praises to you, and may we sing with hearts full of joy and gladness, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.